Over 10,000 companies worldwide, over 3,000 companies in the United States, North America. And I'd say a lot of those companies in North America, as Eric would know, I probably visited with most of those 3,000 companies. And somebody Googled me that day and said, what company are you with? And I said, I'm with all 300 and all 3,090, 190 of them. I said, which one do you want to know about? And I just facetious. I said, you know, but it's, but it's really a lot of fun to know you had to check, check out a few to find the best. And you know, we have the best. Now, Tom Maurer has had years and years of experience. He's built a billion dollar model. He's built 10,000 millionaires. He lives on a house bigger than Bill Gates. He has a manufacturing facility up in Utah that's 10 acres. Can you imagine 10 acres, how many football fields? And you don't walk in and see one piece of stainless steel. It's absolutely stainless steel from wall to wall. And he makes billions of dollars worth of products for other companies and billions of dollars worth of products for some of those 3,190 other companies. But he comes to us and says, my dream and my heart. He, was, he missed the call this morning. He was on the phone with Belinda Bond, 76-year-old. I think the rich, she's doing a book, rich, rich, rich Mom, Poor Mom, or whatever, but her, her rich mom, Jewish mom, Harriet, uh, uh, Tom, she was more concerned about her MS or her problems this morning. Tom was spending time with a 76-year-old woman on the phone this morning. Give him a run. That, that's your statement. Give him a round of applause. Everybody stand up and help. Tell Lamar Parker, Tom Bauer Sr. Happy to have you here in St. Louis, Nebraska. Thanks, Dan. There you are. <laughs> St. Louis and the Cowboy Jones, right? Got it. Well, welcome everyone. If you notice one thing, most people in St. Louis aren't here today. Now, what does that mean? Good for us. Good for you. You got it. That's exactly right. Well, I'm going to take my cowboy hat off because I get a little hot sometimes when I get speaking up here. And I think I'm wired, so we'll just hang that right there. <laughs> that can be like Dan, a little thinner. <laughs> but uh, I flew in yesterday, it took me two hours and a half uh, to get here from Utah. So it's not long to get here. So in 90 days, wouldn't it be fun to have 500 or 1,000 people here? You can do it. Yeah, you can. In my previous company, and I built a company that was a billion dollar company, fifth largest in the world in network marketing, and I did it without ever having been a distributor in a network marketing company. So I think that's pretty unusual. I don't think hardly anyone's ever started a company and never been in the industry and able to do that. But I did it uh, based upon some simple, basic principles that I still follow today, that I want to help people to be able to, if they're if they're of a mind to, uh, to do the same, to duplicate. We need a goal, we need a plan, and uh, I want to help people to achieve what they want in life. Now, there'll be lots of different things you want in life. Uh, some things you want, may want more than others, and sometimes it's difficult to get. I, uh, just a month ago, I, after a three-month visit, I was able to send my mother-in-law back to Moscow, and that was really an achievement. I worked very hard to make that happen. <laughs> and last week, she came back for another visit. So sometimes it takes a lot of effort to make it stick. <laughs> but anyway, uh, with this business, I, I looked at uh, myself, and I... I grew up uh, in Utah in a little mountain valley, and we lived out in a slab side house. I don't know if you know what slab side is, but when they cut a log, uh, you know, there's the bark and the logs around, and you have to cut it square. So the first cut's the slab, and they throw it in the slab pile. And usually they just burn it for something or whatever, but uh, my grandfolks made a house out of it. So we had a slab side house, and it tells you one thing, we didn't have much money. And we didn't have we did have electricity. We had two bulbs in our house, but then kerosene lamps were upstairs. We had a coal uh, stove, uh, two in the house, you know, for heating, for cooking. We had a well with a bucket in it. And for those of you that don't know, some people here will realize that. But at that time, you never had refrigerators, so we kept 
anything that was perishable was in the bucket lowered down in the well because the water was cold and so that was sort of your refrigerator. Well, I tell an outhouse, and I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for Sears Roebuck catalogs, we'd have been in big trouble <laughs> out there because the long for the day you could afford to buy TV. Uh, but uh, I grew up in that environment, and we grew up farming, ranching with horses, and uh, that was my life. Uh, not a lot of communication. I remember the old phones that we had. We lived way out, and it was one of these where it was on the phone, and you would pick it up, take the receiver off and speak into the speak on a box, you crank it. The operator come on, you tell them who you want to, give me Mabel, you know, and then they dial up Mabel for you. And you sit there and the phone would start ringing, you're on a party line. And uh, they'd hear so many longs and so many shorts. And I remember my grandpa folks saying, yeah, that's so-and-so, you know, <laughs> they knew who all the rings were. They would listen to them. Well, quite a change from that time to now, isn't it? In, in less than a lifetime, those the types of changes have come. We never would have thought about flying across the United States. I remember when Eisenhower made a long distance call across America and it was quite, uh, quite a revolutionary thing, calling, just picked up and dialed across America. Now look where we're at. You know, you've got smartphones that, uh, I have a, a five-year-old daughter that can operate a smartphone, and you cannot believe how smart she is operating that thing that my wife says, I can't even operate it the way she can. She goes through all of those types of things. We've moved into an age of communication. You know, How many of you remember when the fax machine was such a revolution? <laughs> yeah. I was talking to uh, Harriet today, and she said, uh, here's my fax number. And I thought, I took it but I don't have a fax. <laughs> because it's old communication, isn't it? I guess we fax a few things around, but it's hard. I remember when the fax came and I could write out a message and run it through and then pick it up in Australia. Uh, wow! What a hate even in my own handwriting. That was something else. And, and so, you see, and then remember, I remember when we got voice messaging on the office phone and you could leave a message or get one, and that is so extraordinary. And I remember I started calling up, some of you may know Beverly in her office, and I called her on voice message, Beverly, this is the devil calling. <laughs> scared the living crap out of her. She had never had a voice message before, and the first one she got was from the devil. <laughs> but uh, it was an evolutionary process. And then somebody came up with a three-way call, and holy cow, three-way calling. What could you do with that? A new world was born. And then uh, people started buying lists and doing mass mail outs and things like that. And then from out of nowhere comes the internet. We look at the internet. I remember when the internet came, I said, you know what? I'm not gonna bother with that. I don't wanna get involved in all that crap. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, my secretary, I said, you probably ought to go learn it. So I sent a couple of my secretaries to go learn about the internet so they could handle that thing. Well, we've seen what that's become and who knows what's gonna happen with the internet. We don't know, maybe someday you'll feel a little jingle under your armpit and you'll pick up your hand and read what the message is. I don't know. Somebody <laughs> be talking into your finger or the, the technology is changing so much that we know not what is coming. But we do have tools within our reach right now that are spectacular for communicating the message with it. And so when you think about what we can do now to what we used to could do, the dynamics are tremendous. But the one thing that will stay with this is is a people to people business, person to person. <coughs> belly to belly can't be beat, but you can't get to the numbers so much as you could before. So you can do a lot of things. But some of the fundamentals that people like to buy from people they like, right? I mean, if you go to a store and you're treated badly, maybe the store's good, but you go back, you don't, or you're going with bad feelings, you know, those types of things uh, with it. So this is a business of communication, and the better we can do it, the better we'll be. But unfortunately, with communication comes flim-flams uh, scam, right? 
And unfortunately, in this industry, there happens to be a lot of it. But tell me where it is not. What industry does not have that? Look at the car advertisements with that ugly little green lizard running around that about drives me crazy. Does it drive you crazy? I don't think anyone looks at that lizard with fondness. I guess it's a gecko, you know, whatever it is. I like to gecko it. But uh, the, uh, the idea of it with, and people are listening to it, and, and, and you look and they flash the numbers and their rates are so much letter, less than theirs. And, and then comes the guy from Allstate and uh, his uh, insurance is the one you can count on and these people have saved this much money. And then here comes uh, Nationwide, you know, with what they're doing. And you see all of these things that are going on and who do you believe? I guess you have to go in and you have to research it and you have to see. And yet you'll have people coming into network marketing with the same kind of thing. They found this wonder juice. It came from a valley you've never heard of, from a fruit that may not have ever existed <laughs> until they found it. And apes lived to great lengths of time. And they were swimming through the uh, trees like uh, Dan down on the farm chasing turkeys and <laughs> catching fish and you know, running around like uh, primates. <laughs> And they lived so long, they did so much, and wow, and it's Hyundai water. You know, I thought Hyundai was a car, but nonetheless, it's Hyundai water, and you can drink it and live forever. And you have this antioxidant, which is the highest auric value ever known to mankind, and you've never heard the word auric. And so they tell you what auric is, and once they tell you, you still don't understand it. With it. And so what's the whole thing about it? It's they take people, and because we're not necessarily in that industry, they confuse us. And they tell, and you sit down. I had a, had a couple come in uh, from Germany, and they have a gigantic organization worldwide with one of the largest network marketing companies in the world. And they came in to look at our company because of communications, people talking to them. They've been searching for one because they're so unhappy with the giant company that they're in because they had lost their icon, and it had become corporate. Mm -hmm. And the more corporate, you know how it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in this industry, uh, it's hard. You've got to have a belief factor. But a lot of times, the belief is false belief. And so uh, people will catch you, but they said, we've been to many companies trying to fight. We want to, we want to believe. We want to buy into it. We want." Uh, something that we're going to do because what's happening with this corporation once they've taken over they're making things so difficult for everyone and they're cutting and doing these kinds of things the excitement is gone from the business and uh, they're a business that uh, their business is for themselves and so they said we've gone to a lot of network marketing companies looking around and as they sat there with me they said you are the only company that we sat down and went through that has talked about products. Others say, yeah, we have a great product, but here's how you make money. We're, we've got a mechanism for you to make a lot of money. And the next one, we, we can show you how to make a lot of money with this kind of thing, and we have a product. I sit down with them and I say, we have products. They're just not products. They're spectacular alternatives to products that either don't work or they work so poorly. They're overhyped and they underperform. And so our fundamental is building products. We build the most spectacular products in the world, and I've chosen network marketing because you can't advertise it. Can you? How can you advertise it? How many big skincare products are there in the world? Estee Lauder, Clinique, Lancome, you know? All of these. And if you look, and I like to tell the illustration, of I was flying along in an airplane, and I looked at this... Uh, a uh, young lady that was sitting there next to me, and she was reading Cosmopolitan magazine. You know, I thought she should have been reading Field and Stream or Outdoor Life or something like that, but she was kind of screwed up. And <laughs> into the wrong thing, she was reading Cosmopolitan. And she flipped it open, and there was a page, and it had a picture, and it had one line. And she just kept looking at it and looking at it. And I thought, she's either the world's slowest reader or she's from Idaho. One of the two, I didn't know which. <laughs> so, uh, and, and here it was. Here it was sort of a, kind of an offset for focus, kind of purplish and bluish. And 
this. And uh, the scene, and on this ledge, over the sea, was this young woman standing. And she's standing there, the no respectable, wearing something no respectable woman would wear outdoors. But anyway, she, there she was, in, of course, a women's magazine, wind blowing through it. Then I looked a little too, because I could call my But uh, that's beside the point. Uh, so she was standing there, and uh, it said underneath that she has never had to worry about flawless, or about skin. She has flawless skin for all of her life. And I thought, well, at 19 years old, that's probably <laughs> true. But, uh, what I like to see is I like to see that ledge. And I like to see her grandma that she used that same products come up. She wouldn't have anything that immoral to wear. She'd come up with a flannel light gown and she'd walk up the edge of that thing. Look out over that. She'd have more cracks in her face than that ledge she was standing on because those products don't work. They make you older, not younger, and they're the most serious health hazard. That's the truth of that article. But what was that girl looking at? the perception, the beauty, the ideal that she wanted, but the reality is just the opposite. It's slow death by toxins when you're using skin care products. And many personal care products uh, fall within that category of having some of the most serious health damaging products in the world. What kinds? The kind that disrupt your endocrine system. The kind that a mother pre-pollutes the baby before she's born. There's 230 toxic chemicals about on an average in the umbilical cord blood that is feeding your baby. So before it's born, it's pre-polluted. Have you heard recently now they're concerned about babies being born that are addicted to pain pills when they're born? They're addicted because their mothers are are taking them. And now babies being born that their sexual development is affected. Girls are more feminine and boys are more feminine. The reason why is these ingredients in shampoos are endocrine disruptors and estrogen mimics. So when the brain is developing it, it is overdeveloping the feminine side and suppressing the, max, uh, the masculine side. So men are not men that they used to be, and are they? I can tell you a simple test why they're not. Sperm count. Not the kind of thing we sit there at night and count, but it's the kind of thing that in 1950, in a milliliter of fluid, there were 100,000 sperm. Now there's 5,000 on average. That's a 95% reduction in men. And infertility has gone right down, and why? I'll tell you why. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal of all places on a back page and it said, shame on shampoo because it is affecting the virility and the androgenic systems in men because it's an estrogen mimic. But not only are the ingredients in shampoo that, let me tell you what else is. The bottles that they come in. Watch him with that hat, will you? <laughs> okay, so, anyway, the bottles, they come in. Anyone drinking bottled water? You're drinking chemical water. What's in that plastic is leaching out into your body, and they are endocrine disruptors. They're cancer-causing. They can affect the development of children's brains while they're growing. They can keep children's eyes from developing properly. There's a study, anybody from Georgia here? Well, the Georgia School of Medicine did a study for the Institute to Prevent Blindness and on hair shampoo. And they said the most common ingredient in hair shampoo, the Institute of Blindness said, we'd like a study to see if it affects children's eyes. And when it was done, it says, yes, it can keep children's eyes from developing properly and it causes cataracts in adults. Now, why would the Institute of Blindness ask the University of Georgia School of Medicine to conduct a study on that? Because the product denatures proteins. What does that mean? It breaks them down, it corrodes them, it eats them. Why? And, and the company selling it said, well, it's made out of coconut soap, it's natural, sure, to start with. And then they react it with sulfuric acid, that's battery acid. Then they take it to the other end of the pH scale and they react it with lye, caustic soda. 
So lye and battery acid with coconut salt, what do you think you got? A corrosive cleaner, you see? I used to sell it when I made industrial chemicals. I made products that would clean up slaughterhouses and break down the proteins and the fats and clean garage floors and degrease locomotives and caterpillars with the same thing that you're brushing your teeth with and shampooing your hair and taking a bubble bath in, if you can believe it. And so, but they want to make it foam a little bit more. So they put some agents in it to make it foam because you want lots of foam if you're in a bubble bath, right? Well, when you do, that's a thoxylation and it creates one of the world's most potentially harmful, dangerous ingredients, 1,4-dioxane. You don't know what it is. It's not listed in the bottle. It's kind of a tramp ingredient, kind of a long for a free ride. See? And so what it does is it's created in the process of doing it, and because it is, you don't have to list it. But it's the ingredient they're so worried about that's in Agent Orange, where all the Vietnam vets are getting cancer. And when you have a bubble bath, you're having a cancer bath. And you're, and of course, most men don't have bubble baths, but women do. And so what does it do? It overdrives the estrogenic receptors in your body. And it's 400 times more stimulatory than estrogen. And so if you develop a breast cancer, it drives breast cancer like crazy. And they just did a study and they found out in breast cancer cells, 94% of them have a parabens in it. And that's a preservative used in most cosmetics. But 100% have got dioxane in them. And that comes only sources, personal care products that you're having, that you're using. How does that? Does this sound like a, a nutritional show or a, a show for you, a, you know, a presentation for you to make money? Or does it sound like the Chamber of Horrors? And yet your bathroom, if you don't smoke, is the most toxic environment you're into every single day. You put more products into your body that are harmful from the bathroom than you do through the rest of the day. All the food you eat, air you breathe, water you drink, or anything does not even begin to come close to the toxic overload that you get from products in your bathroom. Now, I tell you that, and I'm going through it, and there's lots more you can get on our site and you see Sissel say, does it scare you? Or do you think it's just me saying that? Well, you may not think it's just me because I'm here, and you're being polite, or you believe. But here's the point, the science is there to back it out. I'm not talking about things I've made up. These are scientists that are saying that. And Dr. Samuel Epstein from the University of Chicago, he's head of their Department of Environmental Science. He's also a Brit. He's from England, and he's over uh, their agency there for environmental science. And he says, the single greatest polluter of the human body is personal care products. And with that, he's also come back and said, I have, he's head of the Cancer Prevention Coalition. And so he's the head of it, the founder. And he came out and he said, and he's got it in a book, he said, I, me, Tom Maurer, he says, has done more to help people understand the harmful effects of personal care products than my, uh, my Cancer Prevention Coalition has been able to do. Oh. Thank you, but thank yourself. Because how am I able to do it? Through you who care. Because you have a business opportunity and a product alternative to use to believe in. And so you spread the word, see? And so instead of just like, how many saw this article in a Wall Street Journal, Shame on Shampoo? Just me, none of you, because it was on a back page and it was only that big. And don't you think you ought to know that your shampoo keeps your children's eyes from developing properly or suppresses the sexual development of the boys and overdevelops the girls? Don't you think you should know that? And you know it, that it is the major cause of estrogenic driven cancers? From brushing your teeth, showering, shampooing? 60% of those product ingredients in shampoos go in your body. 60%. So what do you think they're doing there? Good or bad? So anyway, I tell you that. Because here's the point. What's the first rule of medicine? Do no harm, okay? In selling, there, there's three things to know in selling. We're selling, we're selling, okay? First is find a need, second is create doubt, third is provide a solution. One, two, three. 
you follow that those steps. Okay? So, if the greatest health hazard in the world is personal care products, in your, well, the worst one's smoking, okay? Can I see by a show of hands how many people here don't smoke? Most of you, okay? So that eliminates uh, from you the single greatest health hazard. How many of you here don't bathe? <laughs> don't don't shampoo. Don't brush your teeth or tooth. Okay, okay. Just can. He's the only one. So think of how big that market is. We both we don't smoke. Most of us don't smoke, but we all use all those products. So you might be sitting here saying, why doesn't why don't they do something about it? Because they were grandfathered in before they knew the science and now they can't get rid of it. Why? Because the lobby is so massive from personal care products. If most of us don't smoke and they can't get rid of cigarettes, how in the world are they ever going to get rid of the toxic, harmful ingredients in products? And the problem, like where they've done some things, say like down in California, maybe you've heard of Proposition 65 that's there. Proposition 65 is California's way of, of uh, addressing harmful ingredients. And in doing so, uh, what they've done is they've created a huge track for lawsuits. And so lawyers are suing everybody about everything. They can find anything that violates Proposition 65, they sue people. And they sue them even for nuisance value. We've been sued on Proposition 65. We've been proved what we sued where it's been wrong with it. But they figured we'll pay them at least $25,000 to go away, see? So they just crank money. So here, here's my point. So what do we do when government regulates? Well, for a lot of things, it just does so much damage, doesn't it? I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Independent, whatever it else. Government does a poor job of governing, don't they? Amen. And they're self-serving, and they're sucking us dry and feeding off us. Yeah. And then things come along, and I mean, you can look at the economic crisis that we're in today. Where did it start from? Well, I tell you where it started from. The thing that happened, it started back in the Clinton era with Republican Congress. <laughs> How was that for an oxymoron, you know? And they created this thing so they could... Uh, do more housing, make housing more affordable. But then along the way, somebody took a look at it from the business world and went, ooh, here is a big crack we can get through. And we can overprice houses and sell them to people with low financing. And then when it gets to a certain point, it jumps up and the value of the house is here and the loan is here. And in the meantime, we bundled bad mortgages together, made a fortune selling it out, and the bubble went up until it burst. So who's the blame? Republican Congress, Clinton, Bush, Obama, government. That's the answer. Government's to blame. Say with it. Now we need some things to protect us from some things, but we don't need all of that crap. We certainly don't need all the waste, right? Yes. If you're giving your child a thousand dollars a week as an allowance, do you think that's a little stupid? <laughs> that's going to finance your or help you with your home and your finances? Of course it's not. And what we're doing is we're giving away money but we're not getting anything in return. So here comes the big economic crisis and what happens. Huge number of jobs lost, okay? And right there at first, and what kind of jobs were lost? <coughs> jobs that were really building, construction, industry, things like that. And most of those jobs were lost to me, by men. So that came right at the end, towards the end of the Bush era, didn't it? But it hasn't gotten better, has it? I saw this morning that the actual unemployment rate with those that have given up now is 15%. I mean, it's 8.1 on the rest. That's how many people are trying to get a job, and they figure 7% has given up. So we've actually, in reality, we've got a 15% unemployment. And how are we going to get that back? Transferring wealth from a class that earns and makes to one that doesn't? Or won't? That doesn't make sense, does it? The best way to, to do it is to make money and pay taxes on it, don't you think? <laughs> I like paying lots of taxes, 
if I make lots of money. See? That's kind of a pleasant thing. You don't like paying tax, but it's certainly nice to have money to pay taxes on, isn't it? And so here we're sitting, but I'll tell you what's really hurt now that uh, hurts me. Well, I'm a guy, and so guys, we can sort of take it, you know, and do it. But now, uh, the last three years, 92% of the job loss has been women in the last three years. And what are women? Well, I'll tell you what they are. They're the backbone of society. They're, and men can get out there. And we lost those jobs. Men lost the jobs, you know, in construction, building, those types of things, those heavy-duty jobs. But now we're losing the infrastructure. And mothers and wives and women, single mothers, all of that kind of thing now are really hurting. And you know what? That puts an unfair burden on them. I remember when you used to open the door for a lady. Remember that? I think you still should. If you don't remember it, you better get back practicing. Treat a lady like a lady. And you know what? She probably will act like a lady. But now, see, I was just... Uh, <laughs> we get a lot of that. It isn't that way anymore, isn't it? And so we need to respect the sexes. And, and, uh, and what is our role to help those people that are... I think that are willing to help themselves or those that can't help themselves. That's, that's how I feel. And how much better can we do it than helping women? And that's one of the, and of course helping men too, the guys, I mean, but you know what? We're a little more gregarious in going out, but when you think about whatever you are, like what Abraham Lincoln said best, he said, everything, I, uh, I, everything I've done, everything I am, everything I hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. I could say the same thing wasn't dad, I mean he worked hard, but mom made me what I am, you know. Women build the quality of life. Men can build some of the quantity, of course, with that, but the quality comes from women and caring. So Mother's Day is coming up, it's a great day to give tribute to women and to mothers, but they are the backbone of what makes life worth living. And to see that now the economy turning to where it is now taking them out of the equation, and who do mothers or who do women really serve? Mostly others, don't they? The old saying, and I'm talking about buckets and wells and not electricity and sewage or robot catalogs, but the saying used to be, a man can work from sun to sun, but a woman's work is never done. Don't you see that? Take care of you do. But children, but sometimes we lose value, or lose perspective of the things that are really of value. But collective, individually we can't do much, but collectively we can do a lot, but we have to have a track to run on. And so if we can't depend on what's going on with government, if you can't count on your future with a company, they used to, there was a saying, as General Motors goes, so goes the nation. Okay, you heard that one. Well, they went bankrupt. Now they've got a big debt. They owe the country $50 billion. You know, with it. Why? Because they're making overpriced cars. Really overpriced and underperforming cars. And that's why the Japanese got the market. They came with a cheaper car, but made better. You know, without it. Now I'm zinging around with this thing. And we we're talking about product, but I'm getting to a point. My point is just because we don't have those avenues anymore, if we can find the right track to run on, then we can do big things for ourselves and for others. Yes? In my previous company, I built a company uh, was worth a billion dollars. We're doing about a billion dollars a year in sales. And I never had any idea it would get so big. I remember once I wished I could do a million dollars a month. Because a computer programmer said, yeah. Uh, or a guy came in and said, when Sunrider did a million dollars a month, they party all night. I thought, gee, that'd be great to do that. I'd like to do a million dollars. I just started getting this thing going in a month. And when we did a million dollars a month, I found out about it six months after the fact. And I don't miss my party. But, uh, <laughs> but we were growing so fast. So uh, I looked at this thing, and at the end, I was doing a million dollars the, in the company in an hour or two. See? And that was the way it, it came. So where I couldn't, I was hoping to make a million in a month, I made it in an hour, a good hour, or something like that. So why I tell you this is so that your vision might not be what you're able to achieve. It could be a lot more. Because we have the dynamics of numbers working for us. And that's what network marketing is. It is smart math. Okay? And you think about smart math. J. Paul Getty said it fast. I'd sooner have 
100% or 1% of 100 people and 100% of me, and uh, that's how this works. But you can have 100% of thousands, even tens of thousands. My previous company, I think, I estimated we created perhaps a thousand millionaires. That was pretty good because between them and people just coming in, there were a lot that had made life-changing money, say, with it. It's not the thousand millionaires, that's just uh, sort of the advertising. And so, now I see with Sizzle, we're gonna create ten tens of thousands of millionaires yeah. all around the world. Yeah. yeah. And, with the, and with the new communication, you can go to bed at night and you can have an army get up on the other side of the world and go to work for you. That's, you sleep better that way, can't you? That's what you can have. So my mission is three things. To create health, wealth, and happiness. And there are three famous Chinese figures, and you'll see them all the time. You may not identify them. Three figures always, again, they stand for health, wealth, and happiness. And they say if you have those three factors in your life, you have got what you need to have a good life. That doesn't mean that money buys happiness, but the lack of it creates a lot of unhappiness. So let's make money, okay? Let's make some real money. Yeah. So as I made my money, I decided I want to share the wealth. Only I want to share it with people that will do it. So if you want to make life-changing income, you can do it with us because I'm paying twice what other companies pay out. Or maybe almost up to three times. Why? Because I built a giant company, and when I sold it, and I only sold it because of a divorce. And I had a partner that was an unwilling partner in, in marriage and business. I didn't think it'd get worse, but it did. So I had to <laughs> sell the company. So I did. But I took a, I take, took $100 million to build the plant, put about another $50 million in the company to expand it out. And it came right here from my pocket. I didn't borrow it. I have no debt. I have no partners. I have my son, Tom Jr. No shareholders, no dividends, no rent. We own everything that we do. And if you take a given formulation, I can produce it cheaper than anyone else in the world can for the same formula because I have the lowest cost. And so that means it's in the product. So if I can produce the, the, the most inexpensive product because I have no rent, no loans, no overhead, none of that, and I don't have to fray to finish good product into me, I can take that money and I can put it into a product that is spectacular beyond anything else in the world if I choose to do it or I can keep it like most other companies do and they do the same old, same old and say they have the best, but it's really not any different in, in essence than another company is. There's a, a famous uh, uh, author that came out and he was talking about uh, one of the very big companies. Uh, Procter & Gamble bought out uh, Noxell Cosmetics, I believe it's Noxell, but it might, have, it might have been another. But here's what he said, his name is Colin, he said, uh, they're in for a big culture shock. The title of his article is Culture Shock. He said uh, that uh, they make uh, Tide and it gets clothes cleaner. And they make Dawn dishwashing detergent and it takes the grease away from dishes. But in, in cosmetics, in personal care products, the results are different. What he said, in, 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 uh, in reality, the benefits from, pro, uh, from cosmetic products are psychic rather than rational. In other words, if you believe they work, that is, your benefit, that is uh, the way they're working. And it says, in terms of ingredients, Colin the author says, there is little or no difference between one brand and another. And the product benefit to the user is how it makes her feel about herself. Does that mean the cheapest product at Kmart and the most Expensive product down to Dillard's is about the same. It could be because they could be out of the same bat, just in different packaging. And I can tell you this, because I'm a chemist and a manufacturer, most products that you buy in cosmetics is the cap on the bottle costs more than what's in it. See? So that $150 product you bought may have cost a quarter to make the formulation. The cheapest part of it is usually the formula. The label costs more, the bottle costs more, the cap costs more. The box that it's put in, does. You see? I went in J.C. Penney's and I was talking with you about J.C. Penney's a few years ago and there was an advertisement and they had a tape uh, running on a, on a TV and it says pharmacists develop seven moisturizers in one and it was being advertised everywhere. Maybe some of you remember it. And I've seen it and I want to see the ingredients because I had the server say, well, I got seven moisturizers in one. Well, that's not so difficult to do. Just use seven types of moisturizers in one. I mean, what does it do? <laughs> 
And so I, I was walking down there and I was with my ex-wife and I saw this tape and I said, I wanted to see this. So I walked over and I picked up the box with me, I want to read the ingredients. So I'm over reading the ingredients. And I'm reading through it. This old old gal is telling that she was she comes galloping over. <laughs> a little overweight, a little over made up, you know, this kind of thing. But you know how they have the girls in there, so beautiful, you know, and they're attractive and all the, everything on, they'll do a facial and, and uh, they're there to do it. And she comes running over. She starts talking about this product and going on and on about it. And, and my ex-wife's sitting there and just being very pleasant. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, uh -huh. I'm reading this thing. And she had, it was in a jar and she, she took it out and she said, oh, this is so wonderful. She had one of these big turkey gobblers, you know, hanging out. <laughs> and so she was rubbing them on her, on her uh, threat. And I was trying to read the label and I just kept watching it going up and down like that. And she said, it's just so marvelous. She says, I've been using it here underneath my neck and it's just going away. And I, I said to her, well, it must be all the rubbing that's doing it because there's nothing in this product that will. <laughs> she said, what? I said, well, what will do it? Nothing here does it. Show me what does it. And I turned around to show my ex-wife and she was running down the aisle. She wanted no part of that conversation. <laughs> but the proof of the pudding is in the eating, isn't it? You hear the proof is in the pudding? No, it's not. It's in the eating. It's in the results. And so our products are based on evidence-based results. So let's cut to the quick on it. I'll come back again and we'll, we'll go deeper. But what's the most important thing that people want in life? Life. Okay? Nothing more important than life, but a quality life. It isn't the kind of life I want to live, spending the next last 10 years of my life in a nursing home, somebody feeding me, changing my diaper, and for recreation, I pack balloons back and forth. You don't want that, do you? But we don't have to. So why do we age as we live longer? Why do we? It's not a disease. It's, it's accumulated degeneration, accelerated decay. And the longer we live, the older we get. But yet, when we're born until we grow to be 25, the longer we live, the healthier we get, the younger we get. So what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Things switched off. And when they switched off, that which is up may go down. Okay? That which was in may go out. And things start to happen because we live in a toxic world. So what can we do about it? What took you from, from being born to age 25 where you were in the best shape of your life to where you hit 75 and they slam you in a nursing home or a coffin, whichever one you got to first, and there you are, and you spend all the wealth that you have accumulated yes. to try and save you or make those last years and the money that you should be giving to your children when you pass on or the money that you should be spending to live the kind of lifestyle you want is gone to the medical field, isn't it? Yeah. Because they only treat symptoms and aging is not a disease. But if it's not a disease, what can we do? Aubrey de Grey, the world's leading scientist, said aging is 90% environment, 10% genetics. If it is, voila, we can do something about environment. Stop smoking. See, you can do something about environment with that. Stop using toxic products in your personal care, right? Those types of things. So eat better foods. Get rid of some of these things. Can you eat organic? Yeah, maybe you can. You know, but what's the problem with organic? Lots of nutrients, no pesticides, no insecticides, no herbicides, lots of parasites. How's that grab you? Yeah. Eat sushi? Anyone like sushi? Oh, you can get a parasite. There are people that have died from sushi because the parasites can grow so fast within them. Fish is one of the most highly contaminated parasitic foods in the world. Soy is the most chemically contaminated product in the world because they spray so much on it. But if you get organic soy, guess what you got? You've got a product that affects your health so badly because it's so overpowering in estrogen and estrogen mimics and keeps your body from absorbing nutrients and, and causes cancer, all of that. If you doubt me, go look at a company se selling soy and they tell you all the good things. But go to the internet and put the dangers of soy, put the dark side of soy in and see what comes up from people who don't have a dog in the fight. You see, scientists, and they'll say, this is bad for you, here's all the things it does and damages to your body. 
And yet, guess what they have now uh, for baby formula? Soy-based. Baby food. Soy added to it. And yet, it has so many harmful ingredients in it. And so, is it one, a wonder that we have so many diseases? Cancer used to be a rare disease 100 years ago. It was 1 in 80. Now, it's 1 in 2 and a half. And the American Cancer Society says, by the year 2050, every person born on earth will get cancer in their lifetime. Is that fast enough for you? See? I have to talk sometimes at the speed that women relate with guys, so you just have to catch a word now and then. <laughs> but I've got this down, so I can, I got my story down cold and I can deliver a pot. All right? <laughs> so we have a great force here, don't we? To do things, to communicate, if you believe. But I don't want you to believe because the money is so good, okay? And, uh, and opportunity is so great. I mean, those things are great. That's, part, that's the wealth, healthy, wealthy, happy. All right, but I want you to believe because it's true, it's real. If they can take the heart out of a baboon and put it in a baby and the baby lives, do you think they can do something about a wrinkle? You know? Does that make sense? They can. I can tell you lots of other stories, but I want to get the product. So, okay, so let's talk about life, about living life, about not growing older. How many of you want to grow older? You want to grow older? Okay, you want to grow older gracefully. All right, well, that's growing older gracefully is pretty nice. If I could grow older gracefully, I mean, I'd be happy. How many of you want to grow old the way that most people grow old? You don't, do you? How about if you don't grow old? Is that a better idea? Mm -hmm. Okay, we can do that easy. How about if you grow young? Yes. Is that not the best of them all? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about today is growing younger. You don't have to grow older. You can now grow younger. I mean, if you live longer and you grow older, why don't you live longer and grow younger? Is that possibility there? And what I'm talking about is the very things that grew you from, from conception to age 25, we can reinstigate most of those back into your body again. Science has evolved to the point of where it is. And we're talking about major breakthroughs in just the last few years. And so I've got a tape here I'm going to show you from a physicist right now which is, a, uh, he, you'll recognize him, he's a Japanese guy, he's all over on programs for science, the universe, and all this, and he's uh, probably the most authoritative physicist in the world, and he's talking about the breakthroughs now that have come on, but this is a couple of years old, so you're going to see my narrative underneath it, because this is what's changed, which he's just done in the last year. However, I think we have to put it into perspective. It is not the fountain of youth, however, it is a significant breakthrough. We have to put it into a much larger perspective. First of all, we know that DNA is sort of like a shoelace. It has plastic tips at the end. Every time a cell reproduces, the tips get shorter and shorter and shorter until finally they fray. And you know that your shoelace without the plastic tips will simply fall apart. That's what happens inside a cell. A cell, for example, your skin cell, will divide about 60 times. That's called the haplic limit. Then the cell goes into senescence and eventually dies. So in some sense, every cell has a biological clock. It is doomed to die after about 60 reproductions. <coughs> However, telomerase can eliminate uh, some of the, the contraction of the chromosomes, and the chromosomes can maintain their length. So at first you may say, aha, we can now defeat the biological clock, but not so fast. First of all, cancer cells also use telomerase. Cancer cells are immortal. Cancer cells are immortal, and that's precisely why they kill you. Why are cancer cells so dangerous? Because they are immortal. They grow, and they grow, and they grow until they take over huge chunks of your body, meaning that your bodily functions cannot be performed, and you die. So we have to make sure that when you hit ordinary cells with telomerase, that you don't also trigger cancer in the process. Now, also you have to realize that genes are also very essential for the aging process. It turns out that we know what aging is. Aging is the buildup of air. That's all aging is. 
the buildup of genetic and cellular error. As cells begin to age, they begin to get sluggish because genetic mistakes start to build up. Now cells, however, have a repair mechanism. They can repair damage to their cells. Otherwise, we would all basically rot uh, very soon after birth. However, even the repair mechanisms eventually get gummed up and then the cell really starts to get old as a consequence. So then the question is, can you accelerate cell repair? That is another branch of gerontology which is being looked at using genes and using chemicals to accelerate the repair mechanism. For example, if I take any organism on the planet Earth, from yeast cells to spiders, insects, rabbits, dogs, and even monkeys now, and I reduce their caloric intake by 30%, they live 30% longer. In fact, the only organism which has not yet been deliberately tested by scientists are Homo sapiens. All the other species obey this basic rule. You starve them to death, they live longer. This is independent of telomerase. This is a function of the wear and tear that we have on the cells. And this is the only known way of actually deliberately extending the lifespan of any organisms almost at will. Now what we want is a genetic way of mimicking this mechanism without having to starve yourself. Because how many people do you know would be willing to starve themselves in order to live 30% longer? Not too many. So then the question is, are there genes that control this process? And the answer is apparently yes. There's something called the sirtuin genes, SIR2 being the most prominent of them. They in turn stimulate certain enzymes, among them resveratrol, which is found in red wine, for example. So this does not mean that drinking red wine or taking telomerase is the fountain of youth. I don't think that anyone has a fountain of youth yet. What I am saying is, we are now finding pieces 